morning, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the Patent Literacy Symposium before we have our endnote today with getting started with universal design for learning. Everyone learns. I'm Karen Brady. I'm excited to facilitate this session for everyone. There's a few housekeeping items before this session starts. So handouts for this session are at the Patent Literacy Symposium Schoology account. The session handouts are in there within the folder for today's session in the time slot for this session and under the name of this session. The session is 75 minutes long and it is being recorded. The chat feature is on for everyone to chat with uh, me and the co-hosts, our presenters today. Please keep your video feature off and mute yourself to eliminate any potential distractions to the presentation. The presenter will uh, take questions from the chat at a predetermined time, so they'll stop and ask for those questions. And we would love for you to tweet out or share on social media all your learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag for the Patent Literacy Symposium is hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. And now I would like to introduce you to our speakers today, Shauna Montgomery and Lisa Smiley. So Shauna Montgomery is an educational consultant at the Capital Area Intermediate Unit 15 in Enola, Pennsylvania. She received her BS in Human Development and Family Studies from the Pennsylvania State University and her Master's in Education of Deaf and Hard of Hearing from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania. As a teacher of Deaf and Hard of Hearing, she worked with students from birth through 21 years of age who had a wide range of hearing loss as well as other disabilities. During that time, she cultivated her passions for language access and development, inclusive environments, and using technology to support students with disabilities. She now works as an educational consultant in the areas of assistive technology and inclusive practices. She is a level two Google certified educator as well as a Pennsylvania certified trainer of language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling or letters. Shauna is an advocate of applying universal design for learning, UDL, to ensure that all learners can access and participate in rigorous and robust instruction and to thrive in their educational environments. We also have Lisa Smiley as our presenter today, and she is an educational consultant for the Capital Area Intermediate Unit in Harrisburg as well. Um, her consulting initiatives focus on autism and inclusive practices. Lisa is beginning her 18th year as an employee of the Capital Area IU and has worked as a classroom teacher a consultant providing direct support for students and teacher of students with autism. And she is now in the role of training and consultation where she designs and provides professional development for teachers, staff and administrators in Central PA region. Prior to her work at the Central Area IU, she worked as a teacher at the Janus School, a private school for students with learning disabilities, as well as a music therapist supporting students in public schools. Lisa has studied universal design for learning for the last several years and has had the great pleasure of attending several in-person institutes at CAST in Massachusetts. She seeks to support teachers in bringing UDL to their students for her daughters, her nieces and nephews, and for all of students in the Central PA region through providing training, consultation, and coaching. So today I'd like to welcome both Shauna and Lisa and everyone learns getting started with universal design for learning. Thank you, Karen. You're Thanks, welcome. Karen. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I was just thinking as we were getting started that um, I've been on the, the Literacy Symposium for all three days. And so um, there's been a lot of really great sessions and I'm, I'm a little bit sad that it's ending. Um, and I say a little bit sad because it is summertime. So like I'm ready to get to my summer, but um, there's been so many good things that I've learned this, this week and lots and lots and lots of information about literacy. And I'm really glad that you decided to join us for this last session about universal design because this is possibly one of the only sessions that's not directly and explicitly tied to literacy specifically. So universal design is really looking at um, how we design instruction for all areas of instruction, all content areas. Um, and so, I know Lisa and I are really excited about UDL and we're really passionate about it and we hope to share some of that with our session today. So before we get started, just a few things uh, as far as housekeeping. At the bottom of my page, you'll see a bit.ly link. That's the link to our slide deck. So you are welcome to um, access that and um, 
you can use, see our slides. And I believe Lisa also put that in the chat. So if you'd like to use the chat just to click on it and that will take you there, you can um, add a, a shortcut to your Google Drive. Um, they are Google Slides or you can make a copy of it and keep it for later. Um, we also have our emails on here so that if um, you have questions that don't get answered during the course of our um, uh, session today, you can please feel free to reach out to us and contact us. And, um, or if you have, have questions that come up after the session and then you're thinking, you know, I remember this UDL thing and I really wanna know more, please reach out to us, we'd be happy to help you. Um, and then we're also both on Twitter. So if you find us on Twitter, you wanna follow us, we, we do um, try to, to tweet lots of good things about UDL and beyond, so. Lisa, anything that you want to share with that? No, I just added the link to the uh, slides again for anybody who joined a little bit later. So I think we're, we're good to go. Perfect. All right. So we, uh, you got to read our bios and after we read them, I think like we're almost done. Like, let's just, let's just sign up. <laughs> you know, everything about us, right? <laughs> but a little bit um, about us. Um, like I said, my name is Shauna Montgomery and both Lisa and I are educational consultants at IU15. And uh, this is a picture of me and my, my two precious girls. And I do have a son, but he didn't make the picture in, in this particular one. So if you see him, don't tell him that I didn't put him in the picture. Um, but um, I, my background is as a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, which I, um, I, I did that with IU15 for many years. I was at IU13 for a couple of years as a teacher of the deaf. And um, I went back to IU15 and took the position of educational consultant. I started with assistive technology and um, then kind of took on the role also of inclusive practices. I learned about universal design for learning at very, the very first time. I think I figured out it was about 2008. So it was about 12 years ago was the first time I ever heard of it. And it was a keynote at a conference that was actually for a, about deafness. And I just remember thinking, wow, like, why don't I use this? I need to start doing this. And so from 2008 on, I, I think I did what I could. Um, and probably three, four, maybe five years ago, uh, the idea of universal design really just kind of came to the forefront for me. Um, if you are familiar with ESSA, we know it's, it's uh, referenced in there. And so for the past several years, I've devoted a lot of time to really learning more about universal design and employing it in everything that I try to do as an educator. So um, I, I know that I am very passionate about it. I'm gonna let Lisa talk in a second here a little bit about herself, um, but we are, we're so excited to be able to do this session for this audience and we hope that um, you'll be able to maybe share our passion about it eventually. Absolutely, I think that I can't remember the first time I heard about it, but it was a lot longer ago than when I really started studying it. Um, and as you heard in my bio, I had um, worked as a teacher of students with autism and, and as a consultant of students with autism. And when I sat down and looked at the guidelines for the first time, maybe four or five years ago, and I saw on the guidelines that we'll be looking at later, I noticed the third column has specific supports for executive functions. That made me sit up and pay attention and say, oh, this is something that I have been trying to get across to teachers for many years and no one's really listening. Now here's this research-based framework that's saying, we need to support kids in their executive functions. And I was like, now I need to know all about it. And hopefully our excitement and enthusiasm will rub off on you a little bit today. We'll see. <laughs> All right, so our goals for our short time today, uh, like we said, we've both been studying UDL for several years now, so we don't expect you to um, be UDL gurus after an hour and 15 minutes, but we do have a few goals. Um, so the first thing we wanna do is we want to just introduce Universal Design for Learning or UD the UDL mindset and talk a little bit about the three principles of UDL. Um, we realize that some of you may be brand new to new UDL, some may have never heard of UDL, and some of you may be old hat. So we wanna um, kind of share a little bit about the, the mindset and the principles. And then we're gonna take some time to start thinking about what are the barriers in our instruction? 
Um, and after we, after we identify those barriers, we want to think about and start to consider how can we design our instruction or redesign our instruction if, if possible um, to include options to reduce those barriers. So those are our three main goals for today. And um, that's what we're going to get started doing. The way that we're going to try to interact with you. So we know that um, the virtual environment has a lot of different ways that we can interact. And I was just on a, a session previous to this where they use Padlets and lots of different things that were, were really wonderful um, to be able to interact with our audience when we're not all together. Um, and the way that we're going to do it is by using a tool called Pear Deck. So um, what we'd like you to do is you're going to have to go into a different web um, page and so just leave your zoom on and I believe Lisa put in the chat the um, the link so if you go into the chat you you click on the link for joinpd.com or you can open up a, a web browser and, and click in joinpd.com yeah and they're not opening as they're not coming up as links so it'll have to be copy and paste into a browser sorry just, okay. just a note Yep, so you can either open up your web page and type in joinpd.com or you can copy it from the chat and paste it into your web page. And once you're there, it's gonna ask you for a session code. And the session code is at the top of my screen. So once you are in the, the web browser, you won't be able to see that. So I'm gonna read it out loud a couple times so that you can hear it. And then that will put you into our session. Once you're in our session, you can just stay in the web browser and still listen um, with your Zoom open. And at some point, we're going to direct you back to Zoom so we can do a breakout activity, um, but we'll talk you through that. So if you are waiting for the session code, here it is. It's lowercase letters, and they are A-R-Y-S-U. So again, that's A-R-Y-S-U. I'm just going to look here to see. Okay, so one, one more time with the session code. You want to go to joinpd.com and type in the code A-R-Y-S-U. And when you type that in, Pear Deck will give you a funny little phrase that um, each letter starts a word and it makes a funny little phrase and then you should be able to get in. All right, and if you have any trouble getting in, um, please let us know in the chat. But we're gonna, we're gonna move on. And the funny code was um, acidic, oh, it went away, sorry. Acidic no raisins <laughs> do something with umbrellas. <laughs> Uh, once you get in, it's going to ask you to uh, rate your mood, and uh, you can do that or you can skip it, either one. And if you are connected to either a Microsoft or Google account, so if you're using Google Chrome or if you're using Microsoft Edge and you're signed in, um, the thing that we like about Pear Deck is at the end of our session today, um, it will send out takeaways to you. So it will send you a document with... Um, the slides and the information today and then your answers because we're going to ask you to type in some answers so we'll give you all of your answers and notes that you have taken on the slides so um well it will give us a link that we'll put in the chat that you'll be yes. able to click on the link and then have access to all the information you typed in today all right so here we go So part of universal design is really to have very clear goals. So um, one of our checkpoints in the UDL guidelines is to establish clear and salient goals. And we told you a little bit about our goals. And what we'd like you to do is take some time to think about what are your learning intentions for the day. And we'd like you, this is an option slide on Pear Deck. So you'll see these four options. So number one is I just wanna gather more information about UDL before I decide if it's for me. I don't really know a lot, I just wanna hear about it and then I'll decide what I wanna do with it. Number two is for those people that you know a bit about UDL already and you wanna start applying it. Number three, you're implementing UDL and want to gain new ideas about how to broaden your application. So what do you wanna to do to move it forward? And number four is you are a UDL rock star and you just need some ideas on how to train others. So take a second and choose your option on the Pear Deck slide. 
and we'll see where everyone is coming in with this. And if you prefer not to put it in the tear deck slide, you can certainly answer in the chat. Mm -hmm. So it looks like I have almost all of my responses here. So I'm going to pop our responses up here on the screen. So it looks like the majority of people, so oh, we don't have any UDL rock stars. So it looks like um, the majority of people are in number two. You're kind of looking at, you know a little bit about it and you're looking at what you can do um, to move it forward. So thank you for sharing that information with us. And I hear my dog outside barking. Lisa, I'm going to let you take over and I'm going to let her in so that she doesn't continue to make noise. Sure, absolutely. So the next slide on Pear Deck is for us to just get some information about your background knowledge. So tell us one thing you already know about UDL and then also tell us one thing you, one question you have about Universal Design for Learning. And again, you can uh, add that on the Pear Deck slide or you're welcome to uh, put that in answers those answers in the chat and we can we can know about what you know about universal design and what you want to know Like we have about half of our responses in. We'll give you a little bit more time. I'm going to show our responses that we have so we can continue to move along. So we have um, things that people know is it provides access, firm goals and flexible means, um, lesson planning, um, UDL in college, that's great, giving everyone supports, it's built on principles from architecture, it involves choices and options, prepares learning for all students from the beginning. So these are really great ideas that people already know about it. And I'm gonna scroll back down and look at some of our questions. So some of our questions are, what are the principles? Um, how do I start to implement UDL? Teacher ad or admin buy-in and how we do that how to share it with others, how to get more teachers to understand how to implement. So hopefully um, we will address some of these things. Like we said, we've been studying this for several years and we're not gonna be able to um, maybe get to everything as deeply as we want to today, but um, we encourage you after our session today to continue to learn and look for resources. And like I said, reach out to us, we, we have, um, worked with some different agencies in some different areas and, and we'd be glad to provide resources. All right, so we are actually going to take some time and we're going to have a breakout room discussion. So before we put you in breakout rooms and Karen's gonna help us with this, uh, what we'd like you to do is on our screen, we have five different cartoons. And so we'd like you to take a minute to look at these cartoons and in your breakout rooms, um, you're going to, when we assign you, we're gonna assign you to five breakout rooms. And when you are invited to a breakout room, we really need you to um, pay special attention to which number breakout room. So you're gonna be either room number one, number two, number three, number four, or number five. 
And you may have already guessed, if you're room number one, you're going to have a discussion in your breakout room about what is the message of cart two number one. If you're breakout room number two, you're going to talk about number, uh, cart two number two and so forth. So when you are invited to the breakout room, it will say the host is inviting you to join breakout room number one, two, one through five. Make sure you look at that number when you go into the breakout room. Okay. Um, so what we need you to do is I think you need to go back to your Zoom window. I don't know if it'll pop up if you're in your web browser. So if you click back on your Zoom um, program and we are going to have Karen set up our breakout rooms and Karen, anytime that you want to pause the recording so that um, we can do this and it's not just some blank time on our, our recording, that's great. Karen, we see that you're talking, but you're muted. Um, that's awesome. Um, I have it here that we have five uh, rooms ready to create. And if everybody's ready, I'll, I'll just launch those. I am gonna stop the recording at this time. And we'll give you about three or four minutes to talk about it. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for your uh, discussion. And we're going to take a minute to go through each one of these cartoons because each cartoon really gives us an idea about one of the main underpinnings of the mindset behind universal design. All right. So the first one we're going to talk about is the one size fits all store. And if you were in that breakout room, if you feel so brave as to unmute your microphone and give us a little taste of what your discussion, what you were discussing when you saw this cartoon. I'll give you a minute to unmute. I'll talk. Um, we talked Thanks, about Jody. <laughs> we talked about the fact that so often, even just relating it to going into a store and and he, seeing a piece of clothing that says one size fits all, and no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that, right. That um, you know, no matter where you are in what environment you're you're teaching, um, students have various needs, and one size doesn't fit all. So we have to tailor what we do to meet the needs of the students. Jody, you're absolutely right. Thank you for saying that. So one of the key messages of universal design is that learners are variable and variability is the norm. It's not the exception. Whether or not you have a disability or not, it doesn't matter. Everyone is different in how they prefer to learn and how they prefer to access information. And we can account for that as teachers when we are using things like the uh, Universal Design for Learning Guidelines. So thank you very much, Jody. If I had a prize, I would give it to you for being the bravest one to unmute and talk first. <laughs> Yay, Jody. Thanks, Jody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so the next cartoon, as you can see, is a picture of a flower in the snow and a flower in the sun. Um, anyone who was in that particular cartoon discussion, if you would unmute and let us know what you talked about. I was in that group discussion. Thank you, um, Jessica. <laughs> thank you. We talked about how a child doesn't have any say over what they were born with, um, the socioeconomical environment they were born in, and it's it's not their fault if they are disrupting in class or um, they just haven't been taught how to act appropriately in class or there's something else underlying um, certain behaviors or um, abilities that they're showing. And we need to make sure that we are giving them an environment where they succeed in and not necessarily telling them that they need to change how they're acting or what they're doing, but what can we do to help them be successful in life. Jessica, I love those thoughts. Thank you for sharing that. And um, when you're thinking about universal design, one of the key messages is that the learner variability that we were just talking about really depends on the context of the situation. So, uh, for example, there is a popular um, social media, maybe a YouTuber, he would call her, uh, named Purple Ella, who is a woman who has autism. And she talks about the fact that when she 
is at her home, she doesn't have autism because she's not out. It's not until she goes out into her community and into society when she has to interact with people where she really feels the effects of having that disability. And the same is true for all of us. Um, a lot of times when we are talking about this particular idea, um, we talk about the fact that when we are doing this training in a face-to-face -face environment, um, and we're typically doing this with groups of teachers, um, we can hold out the microphone for somebody to talk. And while they're perfectly talking in front of their classroom, whenever they are given a microphone in front of a, a group of their peers, suddenly they feel very shy and do not want to talk in front of the group. And so your abilities really depend on the context that you're in. And we are seeing that so much now that we are in this unique remote learning situation and virtual learning situation that our ability as educators is really um, varied depending on our context. If we have kids at home who are hanging off our elbows and dogs barking and dinner to make and, you know, trying to get all of these pieces of home life coordinated while we're trying to plan lessons, we can really see an impact on our ability to focus and be engaged in lessons. So learner variability for all people really depends on context. Thank you for your comments. All right, the next cartoon, as you can see, is an assessment. Um, everybody has the same assessment, uh, no matter what species you are. And so if anybody was in that group, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and sharing what you talked about. I was in that group. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> we just talked about how having the same expectation when it comes to an assessment or an assignment for every single kid without giving them the tools to be able to take that assessment or take that assignment isn't quite fair for all. Right. right. You're absolutely right. And we had a whole uh, day yesterday with a group of teachers talking about designing assessments that are um, able to represent what all kids know. And so one of the key ideas, another key idea of UDL is that when you have a clear goal in mind, you can have flexible means to get there and flexible means for kids to show what they know. So clear goal, flexible means is really critical when you're thinking about universal design and the goal is the most important thing. All right, you know the drill. The next cartoon is someone shoveling the snow and someone asks for the ramp to be unshoveled and they said, wait, all these kids are waiting to use the steps. I'll get to the ramp next. Uh, what did you talk about in your group? Any brave souls? This seemed pretty self-explanatory. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, what did you guys talk about? The first thing you want to do is the thing that's going to enable the most people to access what you're after. And we were talking about there are a lot of, in, in, my, in the region I'm in, I know, there are a lot of schools that have an awful lot of stairs. And I just wonder how that works for so many kids. You know, you go, you go there, there's one school in particular I'm thinking of, and, the, and they, the, the office is on the third floor. So if you want to go sign in the office, then you have to drag all your stuff all the way up all those stairs. So. It must be an older school, because the, um, the concept of universal design really um, applies to architecture as well. And so with older buildings, you can see definitely uh, barriers like that where buildings are, you know, not as accessible as they need to be. So yeah, absolutely, Emily, thank you for sharing that. And so if we think about it even more broadly, um, what's essential for some kids can be useful for all. And to take your example and apply it to my own life, um, when I am consulting in schools that do have, uh, like I'm thinking of one school in particular, there's just all these steps up to the front door. And typically when I'm going in to consult, I have a ton of materials with me. So I have a, a rolling cart and I'm like, darn it, every time I pull up and then the ramp is either around back or way down the side and it's extra steps and trouble for me to get in the door. 
uh, with my wheeled cart with uh, 10 tons of materials and books and supplies in there versus just having a ramp. But um, we can think about accessibility features applying to all people at all times. Um, you know, we had talked before, before we started the recording and, and had people on about the usefulness of closed captioning and, and some people need closed captioning but maybe you are on a treadmill right now and you're having trouble listening, but you could be reading those closed captions. So um, sometimes accessibility features that some people absolutely need, other people can benefit from as well. Thank you for sharing that, Emily. And this is our last image. And we'll talk a little bit, this is a little bit of a controversial image, but if you are in this group, tell us what you talked about. I was in that group. Thanks, Mary. Um, we talked about how on the left, they just all have the exact same thing and with the exact same thing, they all can't be successful to start with. And then in the middle picture, it's showing how now there's supports in place so that everybody gets the same access to what they wanted. And then by the last one, even without the supports, now everybody's successful. Mary, that's absolutely right. So if we're thinking about our um, traditional models of education, the, the picture on the left is pretty much you get what you get. When we're thinking about differentiation, we're thinking about that middle picture where everybody's getting something different, but everybody's still able to meet the goal of seeing the baseball game. If we're thinking about universal design for learning, we take out that barrier to begin with so that there wasn't a barrier in the, in the first place. Everybody can meet the goal of seeing the game and nobody, teachers don't need to plan for diff, different supports for each kid because the lesson is planned with those barriers in mind from the beginning. So the key message here is that we can design around barrier, barriers. And one thing to really keep in mind and I forget, somebody just mentioned it, and um, it's not the kid's fault. And we have to think about the problem as being in the design and not in the student and not in the teacher. So um, I was just recently on a webinar about assessment where teachers were talking about how difficult it's going to be when we do come back to school in the fall because there have been families who've been able to access the, the remote learning and have been flying through it. Um, there, and there's been families who have not been engaged. And now these kids are going to be so scattered and all over the place. And I remember thinking when I heard her say that, thank goodness, people are going to start realizing that it's not the kid's fault. It's, it's a design issue. We had issues with our design and remote learning because we weren't able to prepare for it. And, um, and now here we are going to be with these kids on vastly different levels, which as a teacher, you know, we experience that anyway, right? Our kids are all on different levels. Um, so there are things we can do to, to design around those barriers. All right. Thank you all for um, your discussion in your breakout rooms. And thank you particularly to those brave souls who um, shared your discussion. I know that can be a little intimidating. So this is a picture of the UDL guidelines from CAST and the guidelines are laid out in a way that um, it really is looking at three key areas of the brain and, and universal design for learning is based on um, a lot of research in neuroscience and learning. And so when we think about the ways that we can start to anticipate barriers and then design around the barriers, um, we can kind of break them into three key areas. So the first area is um, engagement, and this is the involving the affective networks of the brain, and really looking at how do we provide options to, to get and keep students engaged. And if you um, are familiar with universal design, this may look a little bit different than it had in the past. So a few years ago, um, the, the creators of UDL really looked at this and engagement used to be on the right hand the right hand side of the chart and what they dis discovered and what they determined was that unless students are engaged in the instruction and engaged in learning that it doesn't really matter how you represent uh, material or what you're expecting students to do with it it is totally inaccessible unless they're engaged 
So they moved the engagement guidelines to the left side of the chart. So they would be what you see first is you're scanning left to right. Um, and then the next section is uh, multiple means of representation. So this is really how are we representing the information that we want students to learn. Um, and this is looking at the recognition network of learning. And then the last one is our strategic network of learning. And we really have to think about what are we going to do to provide options for students to show what they know. So when we think about assessment or we think about ways that students can demonstrate their learning, um, this is really that column there that, that deals with multiple means of action and expression. So that's the first way that these guidelines are set up. And if you look at the bottom of each column, we really are trying to develop expert learners by employing these guidelines we want learners to be purposeful and motivated. So we want them to be engaged, to know why they're doing what they're doing, to be motivated and to persist. We want learners to be resourceful and knowledgeable. So how do, how do they learn to, to know what works best for them? Um, would, would it be better for a particular activity if they got to read about it or if they got to watch a video or listen to a podcast or find the information that they need some way that they're going to be um, able to access it the best for them. And then lastly, we want expert learners who are strategic and goal directed. So we want students who can set goals. We want them to be able to come up with ways to uh, meet those goals. We want them to be able to think about ways that they can demonstrate their knowledge and um, demonstrate that they've achieved their goals. So those are, are the three main um, principles. Then you can also see along the left hand side of the chart, you'll have those gray tabs. And really that's um, another structure put in place for how to implement and how to use these guidelines is that the first thing is we want to provide access. So that top column here, where it says access, is really looking at what can we as educators do to anticipate barriers and put supports in place for students so that they can access the, the, the learning. The next level down is the build phase. And that's where we really wanna be working in conjunction with the learner to have conversations and to say what worked for you and how can we um, now start to move some of the, the onus or some of the responsibility onto the student as they, they work to, towards becoming expert learners to start thinking about what works for them and what um, will help them as they learn and what kinds of barriers they recognize and, and things that they could do or advocate for themselves to um, eliminate those barriers. And then finally, the last, the last level is to internalize. And that's where we really want students to think about very independently what they need um, and how to anticipate barriers or to recognize barriers that are showing up <clears throat> in the instruction for them. And so what they can do to really take the responsibility um, and take the initiative to say, here's what, I, here's what I know works for me and here's what I need. So there's different ways that the, um, the guidelines are laid out. They do go left to right, but they also go top to bottom. And ultimately our goal is really to um, develop students who are expert learners and who are able to um, not only set goals, but reflect and think about the things that will work for them and then advocate for those things. So what we'd like you to do is, um, if you're still in the Zoom window, we want you to pop back into your, your web browser and you should be on this, this page because that's been um, following along with our slides. So take a second and think about a lesson that engaged the majority of your students. So think about that lesson that you finished and you just wanted to take a bow because it was awesome and your students were engaged and they were excited to be there and they, they learned amazing things. Number one, what made it so engaging? And number two, if there were some students who weren't engaged, what do you think prevented their engagement? So get, take just a second and reflect on that for, for a, a, a hot minute.
again, if you prefer to put those answers into the chat, you're welcome to do that as well. All right, so let's look at a few of our responses. I'm not gonna take the time to go through all of them, but maybe there's some, some patterns that we see. So incorporated students' interest. Students had voice and choice. Um, they were reading and responding to quotes, discussions, interactive listening, speaking, and movement, hands-on, uh, hands-on again, multiple activities occurring. So those are the things that um, we're seeing that um, made it engaging, the use of technology. And some things that maybe if there were barriers to engagement, what presented them? So prioritizing. Um, let me see what else I have here. Distracted by the movement. So, so for some, the movement was great and some it was a little bit of a distraction. Um, th maybe it was too exciting. So it was hard to focus with that much excitement. So we can see that um, here students felt empowered and knowledgeable, um, afraid to spell something wrong. They didn't understand the quotes. So when we think about um, our engagement and how we engage students in our lessons, the first thing we wanna do is really think about how what, what kind of barriers will exist and how can we design around those barriers? And then we wanna go back after the fact and think about, all right, so this was great and the majority of our students were engaged, but what about the ones that weren't? How can we pull them in? And um, just like you did here, thinking about what, what do you think could have been the barriers for those, those few students that weren't engaged and then looking at how we could design around that for the, ne the next time. So when we think about providing multiple means of engagement, um, what we would like you to do is think about in general, what barriers exist for your students in being engaged in lessons. So we just did that, that, quick, um, that quick idea. And I don't know that we're gonna take the time to do this again, because we did kind of talk to you about that specific lesson. Um, and we are getting, I think we're gonna get short on our time here. Um, but that's the question that we want you to think about. The very, at the very beginning, what barriers exist for students to actually be engaged in this lesson? Um, and we provided some resources on the right side for ways that you can design to reduce or eliminate barriers. So we have a UDL engagement, the UDL engagement guidelines, and that's um, organized in checkpoints. And we're gonna walk through an activity in a little bit to kind of show you um, a really effective way to use them. We also have a barrier identification flow chart. So it walks you through, is the barrier in engagement? And then if it is, what do I do about that? Maybe my students are engaged, but the barrier is really in representing information. So what do I do about that? And then finally, CAST um, has a Padlet that is full of engagement ideas and it's a wonderful resource. And um, so those are there, those are links for you to explore. Lisa, I, I think I'm gonna move on and not go to each one of these individually because I think we're going to run out of time. We have a lot to talk about and it's 12.03. We do. <laughs> Looking at the clock. So some ideas that we wanted to share with you and, and show how we did this with engagement um, is when we designed this um, webinar, this training, we really sat down and, and thought about these questions ourselves. And we said, what are really the barriers to people engaging in, in this training. And so one thing we came up with is that we said time. Like we could spend days and days and days on this and we have an hour and 15 minutes and we are glad for what we have, but we know we're not gonna get to everything. Um, some other barriers are that it could be information overload, especially because it's day three of a chock full conference. It's the last session before our end note. It's right before lunch. Um, there might be information overload. You might be just totally burned out. You might have Zoom fatigue. That's a real thing. I feel it. I've been feeling it since like the middle of March. Um, maybe there's barriers in accessing materials. So maybe you're not comfortable with switching back and forth to Pear Deck and Zoom and, and we're putting things in the chat and maybe that's a barrier for some people. Um, our response method may be a barrier. So we're asking you to provide some responses via Pear Deck. Um, we put you in breakout rooms. That could have been a barrier for people that were uncomfortable with that. Um, finding and categorizing information. So how do we, how do we or organize all this? And then lastly, we know that there's distractions in your environment. Um, I, you were all very gracious to me as I let my dog back in. Um, so we know that there's things happening in your environment that could, that could demand your attention away from um, our, our presentation. 
So the things that we did or that were part of the design of, of this uh, time is to, to reduce these barriers or that this webinar is being recorded. So if for some reason um, you are distracted or you're not able to engage fully or engage the way that you'd like to, you can always go back and watch it later. Uh, we tried to make sure that we had a really clear and salient goal. We, we uh, gave you our learning intentions and we tried to make sure that everything we did is really leading to that goal. Um, we're trying to provide some feedback and, and offer participation options um, so that you're able to stay engaged. We're providing links on our slides and in the chat box so that it's easy for you to access information. You're not spending a lot of, of your time trying to look for things and we're saying go here, go there, answer in Pear Deck, and we're trying to make that as easy as possible. Um, chat box and Padlet. So Padlet, originally we had a Padlet activity, but we switched it to Pear Deck, so that, that should say Pear Deck and I'll, I will fix that. Um, but the, the chat box, utilizing that is another way that we can help you categorize information. And um, color coding stickies, that was also related to the Padlet, but that was another support that we had designed. So when we think about um, what we've done, we wanted to make our thinking overt so that you can see how we've applied this mindset as well. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is multiple means of representation. And we want you to take a second and think about how are you representing information for your students? Whoever your students may be, you may be professional developers like we are and your students are teachers. Um, or you may be, you're, you may have first graders or you may have 12th graders. So think about your students and how you represent information for them and take a second to just um, provide a little bit of information about that. And for the sake of time, I'm going to show our responses quick and see if we can find some, um, some commonalities. So I see visual, auditory, manipulatives, lecture, demonstration, um, visuals, graphic organizers, videos, pictures, webinars, polls, participant box, Mentimeter, um, several ways the facts are represented, so posters graphic organizers. So all of these are wonderful ways that we represent information to our students. Um, and so all of those are very good ways and, and very valid ways. And we want you to think about, as we go through this next section, um, how do we offer options and multiple means of representation for our students? So again, when we think about this question about representing information for students. There's lots of different ways to do it. And we heard from your responses, some of these, so videos, visuals, um, text is certainly one, using technology, um, auditory information. And again, there's some uh, resources here to help you kind of think about how can we reduce or eliminate barriers? So maybe text is a barrier. So we're at a reading uh, literacy symposium and we were looking at some of the very best information in the science of reading about how to teach reading. But in the meantime, as students are developing those reading skills, especially our struggling, struggling readers, how are we going to provide options for them to access information um, in order to keep them up, keep them um, on par with the, the content and with their peers? So we may have to think about that. And again, the way that we reduce or eliminate barriers, there's lots of resources to help us do that. So we can use our representation guidelines and our checkpoints along the way. We can use the barrier identification flow chart and then there's also a representation padlet. So um, we will let you explore those at your leisure and we're going to look at some of the things. Can that I just add something really quickly yes. back to the representation. So when we are doing our UDL, intro to UDL, um, training at the IU, we have um, different parts throughout the day where we have um, participants read a section, maybe highlight some things, circle some things, and some feedback that we've got was that there's way too much reading. And, <laughs> and it makes us laugh every time because we are teachers who do that to our students all the time, um, giving them reading to do, and then Seeing that as a barrier in yourself when you're presented with a task and you're like, ugh, I'd have to read this article. I don't even want to do it. <laughs> so thinking about when and where 
you can add an option for students gaining that information that you're trying to present. And whether it's an article or could they um, watch a video about the same thing, could they um, examine an infographic instead of having to read the article. Um, it, but it's just very interesting every time that teachers are saying, I don't want to read all this. <laughs> so, and it, and it may even be, I you know, put my assistive technology hat on, it may even be if the, the article is the goal and that's what we have to have them do, that's fine. But maybe it's now giving them some assistive technology so they can listen to the article being read or um, something like that. So all those are different ways that we can design around barriers for representing information. Whoops. So as far as some resources here, we um, developed a resource bank, or we didn't really develop it, we kind of um, curated it from other locations. So for our resource bank that, again, you can look at at um, your own pace, we have an interactive version of the guidelines. We have an infographic about the guidelines and checkpoints. There's a video and then there's also an article. So if our goal um, for here is for you to just learn about that, that guideline of, of um, the UDL guidelines, here's four different uh, modalities that you can use to do that. Um, and then also uh, originally we had done this webinar as a remote learning using UDL and remote learning. So we kept those, those resources there for you also. Some things that we looked at as far as uh, the barriers that we anticipated and things that we um, tried to design so that would, they would be reduced or eliminated was we provided um, text and slides. We tried to provide links for you. Um, I don't think we have any video in this particular iteration of the training, um, but audio so you're able to see and hear us. As far as language- I think we were thinking of our video. Our video. Of us talking. <laughs> yeah. So you can see me waving my hands and talking with my hands. Um, options for language and symbols, we provided a resource bank and the representation padlet. So if you're not familiar with what the language is surrounding UDL or representation or, or what different symbols mean, we've tried to clarify that. And then um, finally, options for comprehension is really having you take some time to share what you're doing. Um, you can explore the resource bank and the flow charts and the other the other resources to help improve your comprehension of this information. Finally, our third principle is multiple means of action and expression. And this is really, how do students show us? How do they demonstrate that they've learned what we wanted them to learn? How do they show us that they've achieved the goal? Um, and so what I'd like you to do, and we are gonna take just a few minutes for this, is on the left-hand side of your screen, there's some options there. And certainly that's not all of them. But at the bottom, you have five check mark icons. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to drag those check mark icons to the pictures that represent how your students are able to show what they know. So maybe they're able to do a drawing, or maybe they're able to do a presentation, or maybe they're able to take a test, or maybe there's something else that I haven't thought of. And if you look here and you say, well, there are seven, and I only have five check marks, and I do all of those, just pick the ones that you do most often. So take a second and just categorize them with the check marks. Which ones do you employ in your classroom for students to be able to show what they know? All right, so let's see what we have here. All right, so we have a wide variety, and I see a lot of um, a lot of check marks on writing. So that seems to be a popular way to have students show what they know. Um, some videos, some drawings. So we have a little bit of everything, and this is a really great way when we go back and reflect and we say, "All right, for this project." This was the end goal. This was the, the, this was the project. This was the test. This was the essay that the student had to do. And as we look at that over the course of our practice, we can say, wow, you know, we, I, I really do tend to do a lot of essays, or I do tend to have students take a lot of tests. How can we provide options? What are some other ways that students can demonstrate their learning? 
Um, and that's really what we want you to think about and um, try to start designing for in your own um, in your own instruction. So again, we have some resources there for you to look at those, those things and consider how we could uh, provide those options. Thank you for your responses. All right, Lisa, I'm gonna let you chat about this one. Sure, just um, remembering that for our students, um, whenever we are offering those options for students to show what they know, a lot of people question how is it fair to give assign a student um, you know a, a different options and then one student does a puppet show to show what they know and one per student does a um, a book report to show what they know and one seems much more labor intensive and um, and how is that really fair so and how do we even assign a grade to those same things and so when we're thinking about that, the best way that I know how to do that is uh, the use of rubrics. And so just thinking about um, providing flexibility for grading um, when you are offering those different types of products. So we did put a link to a rubric creator there if that's something you want to explore. We put an example of a rubric because um, we just uh, finished a graduate class and this was an example of the rubric used in our graduate class. So, you know, I had, I saw some questions coming up either in the chat or online about how to apply it or people are applying it in higher ed and how do I apply this in kindergarten. Um, I just want everyone to know that this is for all learners at all stages of their life. So if you are working in preschool, this absolutely applies to you. If you are working at is, uh, you know, working with doctoral students, this still applies for you. It applies for us working with you as your individual learners as well. So I can't say enough about the universal piece of universal design. Um, and then just a little note about feedback. Um, we know that feedback is just really critical for our students. And so it's, it's the process of meeting the goal that's important when we're thinking about students learning. And um, based on the work of John Hattie and visible learning, we know that uh, powerful feedback has an effect size of 0.7. So maybe feedback is an area where you want to um, invest your time for next school year and thinking about how can I make this clear goal and set these flexible means and then really provide students with meaningful and powerful feedback to help them achieve the goal. And that's really what we're trying to do. And then there's lots of examples there for you. All right. So I just realized that we said we were going to take questions periodically and we have not stopped. <laughs> so um, are there any specific questions, either Karen in the chat or um, that have come through that, that you want us to stop and address now? I did see a question that, um, and it's in a couple parts here. How are uh, the, what's the difference between UDL and design by learning? And I don't know that it's 100% different. I'm not very familiar with design by learning other than just um, hearing about it a few times. So um, Kathleen, if you want to, to ask more about it, let me know. But both are really centered on person-centered design. And in design by learning, the students are the designers and the crafters of their learning. And that can be a component of UDL. Um, but when we are thinking about UDL and, and rolling it out in our schools, we really are, really are thinking about teachers as the designers. And they are designing learning for the students. So the people that they're designing for are the students. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Go ahead, Shauna. I think the other thing is, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you're referring to work like by um, um, McTie and the other guy is escaping me right now. Um, but anyhow, um, Jay, is Jay McTie. Anyhow, um, their whole idea is backwards design. And so really starting with the goal and then designing backwards to meet that goal. And so UDL and backwards design, UDL does incorporate backwards design in a, in a sense in that um, you really have to start with the goal. So when you're designing things based on the UDL framework, you're looking at the end, you're thinking about, you're starting with the end in mind, 
you're saying what is our ultimate goal what do we want students to do and then you are just designing your instruction i think the biggest um, difference that i know of is really that piece of anticipating barriers and saying not only okay here's the goal and here's how i'm going to do it but here's the goal here's how i think it should be done but what what part of that way that i think it should be done is going to be a barrier for certain students um, or barriers in general for students. So I think that's my understanding of the biggest difference. Um, so if that, again, if that doesn't answer your question completely, or if you want to chat more about that, please feel free to reach out to us, um, either via email or um, you On know, Twitter. or Twitter or anything. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of our debrief about how we were intentional in our design as far as showing what you know. Again, barriers were limited time. Um, a response method is a barrier. So some of these I already talked about. Response method is a barrier because I can't just go talk to you necessarily when we're on a webinar. Um, maybe the directions were unclear, you're unfamiliar with tools. Maybe you've never used Pear Deck before. And so um, that was could be a barrier for you to show us what you know or to respond. Um, so things that, that we tried to um, work in were we give optional follow-up, so you're welcome to contact us any any time. We tried to, do, to do a variety of ways to find materials. We'll put them in the chat box. We'll send you the link. We'll talk about the link. Um, the link for our slides are in the materials folder, I believe. Um, looking for other options, so maybe there's other webinars that you could look at, and, and I would definitely recommend that if you are interested in exploring more about universal design, you check out the CAST website, um, cast.org and um, lots of different things that so that as we are in a limited framework here as far as a webinar and ways that you can show us what you know um, the very least we can do is provide some options for you to continue learning afterwards all right so we're gonna really quickly because we are running out of time very fast talk about two options for using the UDL framework. And we have lots of links and um, examples in the slide deck. So if you download the slide deck or um, save that to your drive, you'll be able to access these. And we wanna thank Jen Jennifer Pusateri, um, who is developing these, these tools and is going to be including them soon in a book that she's putting out for allowing us to use them. So I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna let Lisa walk through here since she um, was just at, at a webinar about this last week. Yeah, we're really excited to share these tools with you that are, as Shauna mentioned, hot off the press. And so when you're thinking about beginning the work of universal design for learning, it feels very overwhelming because it's, it's the mindset, it's the framework. The framework is simple, but it's huge. And so really breaking this down and thinking about it from two ways you can approach using the, the implementing the framework in your classroom. Um, number one is the troubleshooting approach, and that um, text at the top there is a link that will take you to that document that you're welcome to print out and use. Um, and the troubleshooting approach is really thinking about, okay, I have, this, I have these students and here's the problem, so what am I going to do about it? And we're going to walk through that in a second. And then the plus one approach is thinking about it from, all right, here's my current practice and what I usually do. How can I expand that a little bit? so that I can accommodate for barriers and learners using the framework. So the first one, um, if you're thinking about what students are struggling with, maybe the problem is your students don't know how to write. So then you think, all right, which one of these nine UDL guidelines does this most closely align with? And so, um, there we go. Thank you, Shauna. Um, you're looking through each of the big ideas under the three columns, and you're thinking, no, it's not really about engagement this time. It's not really about action and expression. They don't know how to write. I think that's really about language and symbols. So you narrow in on the language and symbols block in the framework and think, okay, let's take a look here. And if you've had the opportunity, when you look at those guidelines, Underneath each guideline is checkpoints, and the checkpoints are your solutions and the ways that you address the barriers that you have identified. So if you click one more time, Shauna. Oops, nope, didn't come up. Sorry, go back one. Um, the problem, uh, these are the solutions that you can look to. So when you go to the uh, UDL guidelines on at CAS, 
each one of these checkpoints is a link that you click on and then it gives you additional recommendations and ideas and it also showcases the research about why these particular um, checkpoints are important and where this information comes from so that you know this is research-based and is going to be helpful for addressing barriers in your students. So um, that's the troubleshooting approach. Three simple steps, right? You identify the problem, you look at which one you think it is, and then you try to find out what are some supports I can put in place. The plus one approach, again, goes back to how can I just expand my practice one additional way? Is there one more way that I could um, represent what I'm sharing with the students? Is there one more way that they can show me what they know? And this um, just has you analyze, and I'm not sure if the animations are going to work. Can you, no. Sorry, can you go back yet? A little funky in Pear Deck. Uh, maybe just one more click. Yep. Forward. See if that works. Forward. Yeah. Again. Hope, hopefully, I, I don't. I'm not sure if it'll come up, but maybe if you click on it, on the actual slide instead of the. There oh. we go. <laughs> so if you're thinking about, all right, I usually give slide presentations, and that was last year. I used text and images. Maybe this year I'm going to start to incorporate some video clips and see how that goes. And then next year I'm gonna include graphic organizers. So as you can see, you're just stepping up your approach little by little to expand your practice. If you are assigning readings, um, and last year you had them read the chapters individually, maybe this year you assign the option of the chapter, but you add the option of a graphic novel version. Um, and then maybe next year you include an audiobook version so that you are just continuing to expand the options that you're providing with your students and not starting out from scratch, which is really overwhelming and intimidating. So that is a super quick look at those two strategies. Um, sorry, it's not gonna be longer because it is 1227, um, but we do wanna give you a chance to reflect for a moment. So what we'd like you to do is um, pick one of these options and you can write your response right on the, on the screen here. So um, option one is to identify something that was or could have been a barrier to your learning today. So, so what, what was a barrier for you? Um, is there something that we did to help eliminate that barrier or reduce that barrier? And if so, what was it? And if not, if, if you still experienced a barrier that we didn't think of, or maybe our design didn't address that barrier for you, what could we have done or what would have helped to reduce or eliminate that? Option two is that UDL plus one. So think about at least one area in the UDL guidelines that you would like to explore or try out in your role. And what could this look like? Um, how could this be a game changer for your students? And then third option is viewer's choice. So choose your own topic, idea, activity, um, whatever you'd like to choose and reflect on how it applies to UDL. And we're gonna give you one minute since we're almost out of time, which I know isn't really a lot, but we're gonna stop talking for about a minute so you can take a, a min minute to reflect. And for those of you watching this later as a recording, pause the recording and reflect for longer than a minute if you need to. Okay. That was a quick minute. Um, so things that we see as reflections, the buy-in plus one approach is a great way to help implement. Um, connection issues. So there was connection issues, um, which are always gonna be an issue with um, remote learning. So maybe there's things we could have done, maybe there's not. But the webinar recording later is certainly an option for that. Um, a bit saturated with non-interactive presentations for three days nice amount of interactivity. So we did try to make sure we did some of those things. So um, you'll see that um, even as we go through these and we'll, we'll look through them more in depth a little bit later, Lisa and I will 
because what we want to do is always take the time to reflect ourselves and say, what could we do to tweak our design, to go back and redesign things so that um, we're constantly looking for what are the barriers and how do we design to reduce or eliminate them. So we have zero time for questions and discussion, but um, please, 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 we welcome um, the opportunity for you to um, email us, contact us, tweet to us, um, whatever you, however you'd like to reach out to us, and we would be glad to help you. And um, Lisa, any ideas on our takeaways? Yeah, you're going to end the session and then it will give you the link to the takeaways right there. Oops. And then save and end. Okay. And then it's going to give you a link and then we'll pop that. And if you want to pop that in the chat, okay. then that way people can get the access. So you'll click on that link um, that Sean is going to put in the chat and then you'll be able to access all of the links that we had, had uh, presented today. Well, I didn't, hold on a second. I have to get the whole thing. Well, Shana, Lisa, I, I want to thank you very much as you're going ahead and doing that, that housekeeping item and putting that in the chat. Maybe folks can be um, completing that while I close our session today. Yep, it's in the chat. Absolutely. Thank Perfect. you. So I want to thank you both. I mean, it was an excellent presentation on how everyone learns um, getting started with UDL. And I want to thank all of the attendees for joining all of our um, sessions today. So all of these sessions will be available on the YouTube channel in the near future. Our literacy team will be creating supports aligned to these presentations to maximize learning for families and educators. 